Our reading for this morning is Psalm 23, and we're gonna, uh, it's going to be presented to you on the screen this morning. Makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. stand up here again, and the reason I'm standing up here is because I like to be able to see everybody, I, I, and I like everybody to be able to see this. It makes me feel a little distant, but if we want to grow, this is about the maximum people we can have in the room and have me stand down there and have it work out. So I'm starting to stand up here even though it makes me feel distant, uh, but it's, it's what we need to do. So this morning, we are in Lent. We begin Lent. We begin this contemplative season where we're, uh, the idea behind Lent is to prepare for Holy Week. The passion, the suffering, the death, and then eventually the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a big enough event that that gets celebrated every year, including a time of preparation. That's where we're in this right now, is a time of preparation. And this year, during Lent, what I uh, have chosen to bring us through is a time of really um, letting Psalm 23 get deep into our souls. It's, it's the uh, most popular psalm, and it's not without reason that it's the most popular psalm. Psalm 23, as we're going to discover in the next few weeks, covers our, every situation in our life. If we, if we learn the words of this psalm and let them, uh, let them guide uh, the inclinations of our heart, it will be a good guide for us in our lives. So this, this song, we already heard it, and, and it begins with these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As we begin, uh, what I, one of the things I want to point out is that Psalm 23 is poetry. And while, when, when you've got good writing, good prose, every word is important, of course, because they've chosen the words. But in a story, it's the narrative that kind of carries the thing. But in poetry, every single word is chosen. Every single word is important. And so as we go through this, we're going to find that every single word of this song is like a, 
It's like a little window into a big space for contemplation. It, it's a little, it's a little diving board to jump off into a deep pool. Every single word. This morning, we're starting with the Lord is my shepherd. You notice Lord there is in what they call small caps, right? Where it's all capital letters, but the other ones are lowercase. Whenever you see that in your Bible, that's the word Yahweh. Uh, there's two words for Lord. There's Adonai, uh, which is like Lord, uh, my Lord, your Lord. Uh, it's just the generic word for Lord. And then there's Yahweh, which is the divine name for God. And whenever you see this small caps in your Bible, when you're reading along, that's Yahweh. It's not a generic Lord. So this says, Yahweh is my shepherd. We're not going to spend too long on this this morning because we have something else we're going to do. I really want to encourage you to get and listen to the Dig Deeper material this week because we go because I go very, very deeply into every single word here, and they're all important. Just to, just to, to cover a couple things, we covered the shepherding a little bit uh, with the kids. Uh, the Lord, the one who is, uh, is my shepherd. Uh, he's my shepherd. Uh, what, what does the word my do for us there? Well, there's two ways that my works. One is ownership, and of course we wouldn't say we own God, but uh, we belong to God. That's the way we would say it, like my parent. He is my shepherd. And I celebrate the fact that I am in his flock. And then I shall not want. That's a... I shall not want. The first thing you need to know is that this is want in terms of lack, not desire. And that's really important, right? Because, because to, if you say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and you say, I shall not desire, well, what does a life look like without desiring anything? What does that look like? Uh, to me, it sounds like apathy. That's what I shall not desire anything sounds like. And so I don't think that's, I don't think apathy is the, the life the Lord calls us to at all. Quite the opposite. The life the Lord calls us and wants to empower us for a life that is filled with passion, that's alive. Jesus said, I came that you might have life with a capital L, life abundant. And so this doesn't say I shall not have things that I desire. It says, I shall not want, I shall not lack. I lack nothing. That's what's kind of going on here. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. He's the one who takes care of me. And so I assert that I lack, I will lack nothing. How many of you feel like you lack nothing? Yeah, I shouldn't raise my hand here. <laughs> um, but that's the assertion of this poem, this, this psalm. And, and God is trying to draw us to a place of perfect contentment. Does that sound nice? Perfect contentment and peace. Paul wrote in Philippians that he has found the secret of being content in all circumstances, when we have plenty and when we have little. And he said the secret is Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this, uh, this, the first phrase here, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's an, it's an assertion of faith. I assert God, the one who is, Yahweh, He's my shepherd. He's the one looking out for me. He's the one I trust with my life. And because he is the one I trust with my life, no matter what kind of sense of lacking wells up within me, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say I'm not going to own that feeling like I lack because I have a shepherd. My shepherd is looking out for me. One of the things that, uh, that has been a, uh, a practice in the Christian church for the entire history of the Christian church is a practice that's not very much highlighted in the Lutheran church. So we're going to highlight it this Lent, and it is the practice of meditation. The practice of meditation. How many of you have ever tried meditation before and are willing to admit it? <laughs> okay, Good. The meditation is interesting because there's lots of different forms of meditation, but there's a lot of science. Now that we have like brain imaging techniques, right? There's a lot of scientific studies being done of meditation. And, and it turns out that meditation is very good for our brains. And it's very good for our bodies. 
It's not just uh, it's not just this thing that religious people do. It's it's very healthy, even physically. And I want to give you give you some uh, some of the the thing for those of you who are like skeptical, because I live in the skeptics world, so I understand that. I want to give you uh, some of the research on meditation. Uh, one is meditation in studies has reduced the perception of pain and the pain matrix activation. The pain matrix is all the different markers that go up with pain, right? Uh, so there's a, there's, they do all these studies, of course, and there was one study that they printed in very small print. The researchers found that not only did the study's participants report 20% lower, 27% lower pain sensation after meditating, they were also able to measure 45% less brain activity in the pain matrix. So that's very interesting, isn't it? That not only our, our sort of uh, sense of pain goes down, but our physiological pain reaction goes down when we learn the kind of ways to think that are involved in meditation. The next one has to do with the amygdala, and I am not an amygdala expert. I don't claim to be an amygdala expert. But I found a study on the amygdala, so I thought I'd bring it to you. The amygdala is involved in the way we experience negative emotions like stress. The region, the amygdala, actually grows more dense as a result of stress. But those who practice meditation show decreased activity in the amygdala during their stressful times, and also a reduction in amygdala density over time. This means that, they make that meditation not only uh, changes our stress responses at the moment, it actually uh, plays a role in shaping our brain and our ability to handle uh, stress in the long term. Last is on to read that and then take it back off. Uh, reduced, and I want you all to remember this, <coughs> reduced prefrontal cortex decline. Pre, the prefrontal cortex is involved in processing and memory and stuff. Uh, the prefrontal cortex begins to thin with age, uh, contributing to cognitive function decline. Who would like to get themselves a spoonful of cognitive function decline? Anybody? I think I'd like to avoid that. Right? Meditation practitioners uh, can actually reverse this pattern. Uh, the researcher found that people who meditate for a long time don't show any decline in the thickness of their prefrontal cortex. Next is uh, the reduced C-reactive protein, which is associated with heart disease, which is very interesting. Where are we? Meditation uh, appears to help protect against heart disease. One study of 40 older adults found that eight weeks of meditation led to reduced concentrations of the C-reactive protein, a marker associated with the development of heart disease. So meditation can actually, you know, we talk about it, it's affecting our heart. Meditation affects our heart, but it actually affects our heart. That's, that's uh, you know, physiologically, that's a big deal. Uh, where else? Let's see. Oh, there's a bunch of big names here, but we'll keep going here. Reductions in the inflammation response of the immune system. In the same study of the older adults in the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, researchers found a drop in the expression of uh, a group of genes that activate inflammation and are part of the body's immune response. And inflammation also contributes to vascular disease, by the way. Reduction in blood pressure. In a study uh, somewhere, doesn't matter where, you can, I'll give you this afterward if you want to, uh, patients with hypertension were instructed to try uh, a daily meditation uh, as developed by a cardiologist. After three months of practice, 40 of the 60 patients were able to reduce their medication thanks to reduced levels of blood pressure. The meditation practice helped the body increase the production of nitric oxide, a gas which is used to expand blood vessels, increasing channels through which blood can flow, lowering the pressure required to pump through the body. So my question is, would you rather sit and relax for 20 minutes, or would you rather take a pill? I don't know about you, but that's, I mean, I'm always looking for a chance to sit and relax for 20 minutes, 
And if it so happens that that also helps me reduce my medications, that seems like a pretty, pretty big thing. So uh, meditation is good. Uh, meditation has been practiced for thousands of years as something that people have found beneficial. Science is now, through uh, imaging technologies, finding the benefit of meditation. And uh, now, how many of you did not grow up in a Lutheran church? Okay, I love that, by the way. Uh, here, here is where, how many of you didn't grow up in church at all? Okay, a few people. All right, good. Now, this is, this is your shining moment, and I'm telling you why. This is your shining moment because this is the moment where the people who grew up in church are going to be more uncomfortable than you. <laughs> Not that you're uncomfortable now, but you remember when you first came to church, it was like, oh, I'm checking it all out. What kind of people are these? Are they odd? Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're all going to meditate together. I have, uh, and, and the reason I'm doing this is because I made for you, and I'm hoping that as, your, as part of your Lenten observance, you are willing to, you know, people give up food, or people give up this or that, whatever for Lent. What I'm hoping you'll do is give up a little time every day to meditate on Psalm 23. To let these words really sink into you. And it's not, um, uh, Psalm 1 says uh, uh, that on the law of the Lord we meditate day and night. That's the blessed one. And so I want to try this idea of, of meditating on Psalm 23 during Lent, and I hope that you will uh, join me in putting aside a little time every day to meditate on Psalm 23. And I made CDs. There's a whole stack of them out there, and they have uh, uh, they have different lengths of meditation depending on how much time you have. There's seven, five, seven, twelve, and twenty-four minute meditations, and then there's two different kinds of meditation. There's one that's very, very guided. There's lots of talking over it. Uh, that's what we're going to do together this morning. And then as you get used to letting your thoughts flow, as you're, as you're quietly meditating and hearing the scripture, as you get used to your thoughts flow, you're probably going to want to switch from this highly guided meditation to one that's just sort of slowly and gently walks you through Psalm 23. And then you kind of just let yourself meditate on those words. And seven minutes isn't too long. That's not bad. Uh, and, and then there's, like I said, there's seven, there's uh, 15, 12, 15, and 20. And then I'm going to send them out. They'll go on an email later today or tomorrow, too, because I know a lot of people are more like podcaster types and stuff. If I get a CD, the very first thing I do is rip it into my computer, throw it on my phone, and then lose the CD somewhere. I can't even find it anymore. So here's what we're going to do. I just want you to relax, and uh, this is the seven-minute meditation. And we're all going to do it together. I'm just going to start it, and you close your eyes and relax. And let yourself be carried through a seven-minute meditation on Psalm, on Psalm 23. Here we go. Welcome to this time of meditating on Psalm 23. Put aside all your thoughts, all your to-dos, all your worries. They will still be there when we are done if you decide you want to pick them up again. Let everything go for the next few minutes. Breathe. Slowly. Gently. Spend a few moments in awareness of your breathing. Feel the air moving. Feel your lungs expanding and contracting. Feel your breath. Relax your body. Let the words of Psalm 23 wash over you. Hear them now as God's word to you. Just listen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now we'll spend some time meditating on Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You are lying down in a beautiful pasture. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? You are thirsty, and your shepherd leads you to a cool pool of clear water. You take a drink and feel the refreshment as the cool and delicious water flows through your mouth and down your throat. Imagine the refreshment of water and the beauty of the pasture. He restores my soul. Let images of restoration come into your mind. The beautiful pasture, the cool water, laughter with friends, loved ones who have shared difficult times with you and brought you comfort. Think of times that have been restoring and see the shepherd of your souls with you, shepherding you in love. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Think of the paths in your life, the path of this day, the path of this year. Your shepherd leads you in right paths. Imagine walking down paths, but imagine walking with your shepherd who loves you. Feel him holding your hand or see him walking into dark places ahead of you. Walk with your shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What are you afraid of? Think of it. Think of it now. Think of yourself walking toward it, but you are not alone. Your shepherd walks with you, bringing protection and guidance. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Imagine the things that you feel stand against you in some way. Imagine yourself in perfect peace in their presence because of your shepherd. Such peace that you can sit down and eat a delicious meal. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Anointing is a generous and loving welcome. It's the kind of hospitality that puts the one invited at ease. This is the welcome and hospitality you receive from your shepherd. Imagine yourself being welcomed to a table to come in and sit down with the good shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the promise of the shepherd. With goodness you will have joy and peace. Now we'll have some quiet moments. We've been through Psalm 23. Let your thoughts go. Feel your breathing. Let Psalm 23 speak to you in these quiet moments. We are nearing the end of our meditation time. Continue to breathe. Imagine yourself walking from your pasture back to where you are now. Your shepherd is with you. Don't hurry. Walk slowly. 
Come gently back to where you are seated. Give yourself time. When you are ready, open your eyes and go your way in peace. Your shepherd is still with you. I could have designed the calendar myself. I wouldn't have chosen the Sunday we'd lose an hour of sleep. <laughs> I couldn't do that. But still, it was very nice. Uh, what you, I will tell you what you're going to find is that uh, the more often you do it, the faster the time actually seems to go. And if you start the practice of this every day, pretty soon, seven minutes is not going to feel like long enough. And if you only have seven minutes to do it, you're going to how to cut it down to seven minutes. Paul tells us, uh, as followers of Christ, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and uh, we spend an awful lot of time in Bible study. We like to understand. It's a good thing to understand. We, we try to delve into things and, and find the depth and breadth and understand the culture and everything so we really get what's going on. But we have this whole other part of our mind, which is this... Uh, different part that the scripture needs to speak to. And part of renewing our mind, the transforming of our mind is going to be letting the scriptures wash over us and, and just spending time chewing on them and letting them do their work on us. And that's what I encourage you to do. Uh, this Lent is, is to, uh, if you're going to give up something, give up a little time every day to let Psalm 23 wash over you. The CDs aren't over on the table, and like I said, uh, they'll also go out uh, in email, either today or tomorrow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have, uh, you have brought us here together. You have brought us here together in grace and in love. Uh, you have called us in the name of your son Jesus uh, to be your sheep, you are our shepherd. Teach us how to live life in your peace. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.